And then people say, my God, I don't live in Alameda County. So we did it for San Francisco. We did it for Contra Costa. This is Marin County. Um, again, relatively small numbers. Not small, you know, in the scheme of things, but small for this analysis. And you see a relatively flat line, but then as poverty groups start to increase, and Marin only goes to neighborhoods greater than 20% of the population living in poverty. In Alameda County, you go to 30, 40, you know, there's some neighborhoods that are so concentrated in terms of poverty. But Marin, you don't have those. But look at the drop between, between 10 and 20 and over 20 in terms of life expectancy. That's the cost of being poor measured in death in Marin County. That should be a flat line in an equitable society. It is not flat. We have work to do. So this is the Bay Area as a whole. And you can actually take the slope of that line and uh, essentially monetize it. This is uh, California as a whole. If you look at the Bay Area and monetize that line, you come up with a calculation that $12,500 in household income buys you a year of life. So that's how much you're worth. And I encourage people to use that <coughs> next time they're negotiating a raise. <laughs> this is very useful information. It's not just about the next BMW. It is about a year of life, boss. <laughs> so we've done this in Baltimore, as I showed you, New York City, uh, Philadelphia, Minneapolis, St. Paul, Colorado, California, Cleveland. We have not yet found a flat line. Marin came pretty close, actually. Pardon me? Not bad data, just not enough. If, if we did it over more time, we probably could see some phenomena. We have found one flat line, though, and I'll tell you about that later. And Rochelle knows what it is, and Larry knows what it is, so don't say it. OK, so we, we turn this around a little bit now. We did mortality, which is kind of the inverse of life expectancy, just to compare all of these different places. And the thing that's most interesting about this is that um, down to the left part of the graph here, you see, which are the wealthier neighborhoods, you see this kind of anchoring. And I, I like to refer to this phenomenon as you can't buy yourself immortality, meaning that you know Bill Gates doesn't live to a million and six. Um, ultimately, physiology does catch up with you. Um, this is mortality. Mortality is the inverse of life expectancy. So low mortality is good, high mortality bad. So as you move out into poorer neighborhoods, you start to see this fanning out of, of the, what we call the social gradient. And we actually do believe that the flatter lines are the more equitable communities. It's a very crude measure. Death is not the perfect measure of health. But it's an important one, the length of your life. There's all obviously quality of life issues. There are issues about you know, sort of like health status while you're alive. But because death is a very good source of universal data, we think that it's significant that uh, some of these lines are flatter than others. And the goal, ultimately, would be to flatten all of these lines. How poor your neighborhood is shouldn't dictate how long you live. But it does, in a very predictable fashion. We did some interesting stuff uh, in the Bay Area. We went to Kaiser, and we said, you know what? We have this interesting social gradient, and we'd like to see how Kaiser members fare in using this data. So they were very nice, and they ran Kaiser and Rollies, who had died um, over time, and compared it to our gradient. And one of the things that you do see is that down in the wealthy communities, you know, there really is no difference. Again, these things anchor. down. In, most people are insured. Most people have access to sort of resources in those communities. But as you move out into poorer communities, it does make a difference. But what is it? Being a Kaiser member doesn't just mean that you have health insurance. It also means that you're likely employed or that you belong to a household unit where somebody is employed and insured. So we think that people living in very poor neighborhoods who are Kaiser members versus those who are not, there are different populations, not just on the basis of health insurance. There are different populations socially and in a whole bunch of other measures. But the most significant thing about this is that being a Kaiser member doesn't protect you from the social gradient. It is not a flat line. So living in a poor community and being a Kaiser member still means that your uh, mortality rate and conversely your life expectancy is shorter than if you live in a wealthy community and you're a Kaiser member. Oops. Okay, so this has been um, 
information has gotten the attention of the press, been on the front page. When we did it with Baltimore, they put it on the front page of the Baltimore Sun. Uh, this is a graphic from Alameda County that was in the Chronicle. Uh, this was also in the Chronicle. There was a series of uh, reports in the Contra Costa Times and the Oakland Tribune recently that actually studied stories of people in these various communities and described a constellation of, of stressors in their lives and how they interpreted those stressors as having a bearing on the quality of their lives and their health. That report actually won the White House Correspondents Association Award, Edgar Allan Poe Award, this year. So the reporters were very happy with me because they got to meet President Obama and, 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 and get a nice award. Um, but the point of this is, the point of showing you this is that part of this work, which I'm going to talk about in a minute, is really changing the narrative about health. It's not talking about health narrowly as sort of a medical, industrial concept. That health is really about sort of the resources that we make available universally to communities. And the fact that everybody needs these resources, the way that we essentially meet them out in the society is through the ability to pay. And other societies have taken other strategies around this and, and made investments in early childhood, in high quality education, in parks and rec, in institutions and campuses like this that benefit the whole community. And those resources are health protective. And I'm going to make an argument for you in a second that the more that these things are equitably distributed, the better everybody's health is. It's not just the poor's. I'm going to quickly just talk about some of the uh, very discrete examples of where social policy has impacted health. This is a racially restrictive covenant pulled up on a property in Alameda County. I've had three properties in Alameda County. They've all had racially restrictive covenants on them, which meant that I wasn't supposed to own them ever. A racially restrictive covenant, basically, this one reads, no person or persons of the Mexican race, which I love because I'm not quite sure what that is, or other than the Caucasian race, shall use or occupy any building or any lot, except that this covenant shall not prevent occupancy by domestic servants of a different race, domiciled with an owner, tenant, or occupant thereof. I used to joke with my wife that, you know, if I was her domestic servant, I could live in the house. <laughs> and she said I would make the world's worst domestic servant. Uh, but this was federal housing policy, um, which read uh, verbatim, it is necessary that property shall continue to be occupied by the same social and racial groups. So this was an argument for redlining policies. We actually spent some time looking for these racially restrictive covenants in Alameda County. We found them everywhere we looked, uh, particularly in the older communities. Uh, in fact, whole tracts of land were racially restricted in Alameda County. Um, we actually pulled up redlining maps of the city of Oakland. Redlining, for those of you who don't uh, know what that is, it was basically federal policy to um, value different neighborhoods based on the, a, a variety of different uh, variables, including the racial mix. Um, the uh, green and blue properties were first and second grade, respectively. Third grade properties were sort of like, you know, you're getting a little questionable there. Uh, the fourth grade were toxic. Basically, it meant that the federal government wouldn't underwrite any mortgages in those communities and wouldn't uh, guarantee uh, insurance in those communities. So people were pretty much on their own in red property. So we took the redlining map, transposed it to GIS for Oakland, and thought we'd have a little fun by looking at the census and looking at where African Americans lived. Um, each one of those black dots is 200 African Americans um, in 1940, uh, 1950, and 1960. So the, and, and, and people have said this to me, so I'm not just being you know combative about this but you know people said to me this you can't blame social policy for where people live people live where they choose to live <laughs> and I'm like well here's my data where is yours <laughs> I mean that is a statement that is devoid of any rational analysis of reality yet people make it all the time these people have self-segregated. That's another argument that I've heard. We decided to superimpose those red zones that I showed you of short life expectancies. There's one of them in West Oakland. There's another one in East Oakland. And we have actually talked to people living in homes 
that either they or their parents or their grandparents bought at this time because it was the only place that they could live. And they knew it. This was where they could invest their life savings. They were essentially robbed of the opportunity to take gains in equity that were backed by the federal government and by private entities and translate that into their children's college education and other investments that you know we've all used and, and recently got into some trouble for using um, to finance many other uh, important life um, endeavors. Okay, so you may have grown up in a place that looks like this and played in parks that look like that or shopped in downtowns that looked like this. I actually did. I grew up in a very nice community in Montreal, Canada, and I think it actually influenced my outlook on life. Um, I really felt like and still feel like I can do anything. Um, I don't feel constrained. I didn't feel devalued. I felt, you know, very much part of uh, a supportive enterprise. But if you grow up in a place that looks like this or this, and this is your park, what is the message to you? I mean, seriously, what is the message to you? The message is that you're not as valuable as other people, and you should know this. And you should be reminded of it day in, day out. And when you see, you know, essentially, you know, abandoned things just sort of littering your neighborhood, that's because you're not that valuable. You're kind of abandoned too. So living in that neighborhood, are you more likely to smoke? I mean, society doesn't care about you. Why should you care about yourself? Now, you know, there are always people who say, well, you know, my grandmother grew up in a place like this, and now she's CEO of Chevron. And it's like, yeah, but what's the likelihood of that? I mean, we're talking about odds here. We're not talking about individual Horatio Alger stories. We're talking about what's the likelihood of this happening when you create this constellation of stressors in people's lives. What is the likely outcome? And did this kid create these conditions? So public health needs to think about what it is we can do to change those environmental conditions. So the argument, very simply put, is that you have to address social inequities if you want to address health inequities. There's no prescription that you can write on a pad for these things. It requires bringing people together looking at policies and trying to figure out a better way forward. Okay, so who decides? Who makes these conditions? Well, I would argue that it's not some strange, you know, darkened room with people chomping on cigars trying to screw, you know, poor people. I, it's people like us, quite frankly. And unfortunately, I mean, historically, there probably were guys in, in a room with cigars. But these days, most of these agencies and decision-making bodies are people by, by regular people, for the most part, who are unfortunately conditioned to make decisions that take the path of least resistance. And so when you have an opportunity to do certain things, and I'll, I'll offer some uh, examples, when you've got to place the toxic waste dump, I ask people, is anybody in this room not generating any garbage? This is Marin. There's got to be one. <laughs> oh, they're in Fairfax. Okay. We've got to go up there. So we all benefit from these land uses. But who disproportionately has to live in, in close proximity to these land uses? And why is that? Who's making the decisions about where to site these things? It's people like us, quite frankly. And we know that if we want to put it in certain communities, they're going to come at us, and this is Marin, heck, they're going to come at us with lawyers and their lawyers' lawyers, and they're going to make it very difficult for us. Yet other communities are probably not going to raise as much of a ruckus. So knowing that, we have sort of an added responsibility to take actions that are equitable. But generally we don't, because we like to take the path of least resistance. And I will, t I, I will tell you that as a public health director, we did this all the time. We did what was easy. Because it was easy. And rather than incur the wrath of, we didn't have supervisors like, like this. We had supervisors, well, I shouldn't say that because they're your colleagues. But some of them um, really would uh, make it difficult for you to do the equitable thing. Because it just made more problems for them. And lawyers would show up at their door. 